The Holy Gospel for this Pentecost Sunday comes to us from St. John, the 15th chapter. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer, and about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the gospel of our Lord. You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. You may be seated. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we pray this day. We pray that we might ever be mindful of your presence, that we be aware of your work among us and in us and through us. We ask, O oh Lord, that the Advocate, whom you send in your name, will lift us up to new faith by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. It is good to welcome you on this uh, holiday weekend. Good to have you here on this Pentecost Sunday, one of the major festivals actually in, in the church here. Uh, we know very, we know how to do Christmas that festival in the church here. We know how to do that very well. In fact, uh, it kind of boils over sometimes and, and it uh, overwhelms us. It becomes so big. And we also are good at doing Easter. We bring out the trumpets, we bring out the bells, we bring out the voices, uh, we raise our voices, we bring out the lilies, we have parades. We do Easter well also. And so we come now to Pentecost and we say, we're ready. That's it. And we're grateful for those of you who wear red. But it's almost like, have we just gotten tired maybe of festivals? We don't quite know what we should do with Pentecost. And maybe it's because we're intimidated by what we read about that first Pentecost, that, that there was a wind that aroused the entire city and people wondered what was going on. And there are flames of fire on the heads 
of the apostles and the believers. We know that we can't duplicate that. In fact, as Lutherans, we're a little intimidated by that. We're a little afraid of, of, of the power of the Spirit and how it moves us. Ginger Barfield, Professor Ginger Barfield, says that the lessons for Pentecost Sunday, all those lessons point to the fact that our world at this moment is God-drenched. Our world is God-drenched. And we say to ourselves, if that's the case, then why is our world in such a mess? What nature is doing in Nepal, what people are doing to each other in the Middle East and all over the world? Why in the world are there starving children if our world is God-drenched? And so we come, become even more confused, perhaps, as to what Pentecost is all about and how we, as God's people, should react to that amazing event recorded for us in the book of Acts. Anne Lamott, who is a rather irreverent believer, but who just sometimes says it in just the right way. In her very small book entitled Help, Thanks, Wow, describes how she has a God box. And in her God box is what she slips a paper, prayers that she puts in there for God. When she re finally reaches the point where, where she doesn't know what to do anymore. And even as she's putting the prayer into her God box, she is reminding God that she hasn't run out of solutions herself, but she's just a little weary and tired, and so she's going to turn it over to God. And then she says and writes that when she puts that prayer in her God box, she says, after you put a note in the God box, you will go a little limp. And in that divine limpness, you will be able to breathe again. Then you're halfway home. In many cases, breath is all you need. Breath is Holy Spirit. Breath is life. Your breathing this morning my breathing this morning is of God's grace. God giving us his life for us to have life. His spirit working in us. We are in a God-drenched world. There are all kinds of, there are several passages in scripture that remind us that the breath the breath of God becomes our breath, becomes our life. In Genesis, of course, the creation account that we're familiar with, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. The breath that you and I have is God's very breath of life for us. And then there's a wonderful passage in Ezekiel, the 37th chapter. Ezekiel, the prophet, is brought by God to this, this valley of bones. And it's a valley of soldiers that have been killed in battle and they have become nothing but bones and God asks Elijah, can these bones live? And Elijah says, that's up to you, God. Up to you, Lord. And then he says to Elijah, this is what I want you to do. Prophesy to the breath. Pro
prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Do you sometimes feel like you have dry bones? Bones that can never again enjoy the bounty of life. Then I ask you to also trust in that breath that you take in and exhale and think and know that it is God himself offering you that breath and know that it is God's Spirit who enables you to stand again, to get up on your feet and behold the goodness of life. In the Gospel of John, John tells us the the Pentecost story a little differently than does Luke in the book of Acts. After the resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples, and Jesus, as he always did, said, Peace be with you when he came into their presence. And he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed the breath of the Spirit. We receive that Spirit in baptism. You and I are breathing the Spirit. So what then do we do with that? Lawrence Freeman, who is the director of the World Community for Christian Meditation, writes, however fit or metabolically efficient your body may be, you're not really healthy if you're self-fixated and unaware of those around you. You can hardly call that a state of health, of being healthy or being whole. We're not really healthy if we are self-fixated If we only dwell on my breath as what it can be for me, we're not healthy people. But we have been given the gift of the Spirit. And in Galatians 5, we are told what that fruit of the Spirit is. A couple weeks ago, we were winding up confirmation And we were talking about the Holy Spirit, the Apostles' Creed, and the three articles of the Creed, uh, talking about the Holy Spirit. And I gave them a worksheet, the students a worksheet, uh, with these gifts, this fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5. uh, Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Uh, Some translations then say goodness, but I like the translation that says generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I asked the students, what they thought was the most important of those fruits of the Spirit. And many of them, most of them said love. Loving parents, uh, loving one another. And I asked them, well, which one do you think is the most difficult? And they said patience. Patience with their brothers and sisters in particular. They were an honest group of kids, I tell you. But then there was one student who said he thought what the most important gift was generosity. The most important gift of all these fruits of the Spirit, learning to be generous. And then he also said faithfulness. The fruits of the Spirit The Spirit works in us to accomplish God's will because we are 
Our world is drenched with God if we are paying attention to God. And the, fruit of the fruits of the Spirit are that we do become more loving, that we do become more caring, that we do become more compassionate. And that is not of our own doing. It is God at work in us. And so we celebrate Pentecost because every day God is immersed in our world through us. And the final outcome of it all is what we hear in the Psalms. There are 150 Psalms, and the very last verse of Psalm 150 says it. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That is why we're given the breath of life, to tell the world that God has come to save us, to redeem us, to love us, and ultimately that we praise him. And so that is what we do. Amen.